Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Whether it's spring planting, fall harvesting, or just a drive across the state, Soy Bio Diesel helps a diesel powered engine operate in a demanding job. Soybean oil from Nebraska soybeans makes biodiesel a renewable fuel that's also environmentally responsible. The soybean checkoff plays a major role in supporting the use and availability of biodiesel. The Nebraska Soybean Board, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Corey Walters analyzes the USDA's June crop report. We show you how farmers near Euling are recovering from last week's hailstorm. Amit Jala updates us on herbicide resistant weeds in Nebraska. And Gary Sullivan talks about the impacts of distillers' grains on meat quality. UNL Extension economist Corey Walters is our marketing analyst this week. The USDA Wednesday released its June crop report. The agency left alone production numbers for this season's corn and soybean crops and only slightly reduced soybean ending stocks to 125 million bushels. After a tough growing season for winter wheat, the USDA is estimating total production will be down 10 percent from 2013. Overall, though, the report was relatively tame, although all three markets did close lower Wednesday. We talked with Corey Thursday morning and asked if this was a scenario where no news was good news. Yes, yeah, absolutely. No news is good news. Um, we're, we're essentially in a kind of a wait and hold pattern right now until we get through uh, uh, the end of this month. Anything to know as you look at the corn numbers? Um, nothing too particular, just that at least they didn't change anything mm -hmm. um, on the old crop side. The new crop side, it's, it's fairly uh, common not to see uh, an acreage or a yield change at this point right now. We're, we're waiting until that, that June 30th, yeah. uh, July WASDE report. Sort of stacking up all the, uh, all the snowballs for that one. Yeah, and they're, they're out right now looking uh, get, you know, for the, the acreage report, mm -hmm. getting those estimates right now. So, yep. Let's look at soybeans here. Uh, one of the things to note, and that's really the trade has been keeping an eye on, is the stocks number. The old stocks number is reduced 5 million bushels to 125. Tell me, though, how that relates U.S. Su supply to world supply. So we reduced the, the U.S. supply by 5 million, and globally the stocks went up just slightly, not, mm -hmm. not a real big change. Um, you know, for the U.S. side, when you, when you get really low on a stock, you're going you're gonna to immediately start incentivizing, bringing in stocks from somewhere else, right? So we're seeing that. Um, we're, we're up at 90 million uh, uh, on imports, million bushels. Uh, and that's almost three times more than we had uh, just a couple of years ago. World supply, though, is enough to meet demand at this point, do you think? Well, the price hasn't, uh, you know, shot up so high that we yeah. uh, we really cut it off. But uh, yeah, it appears we're in that that right price range right now. And and with that, you know, we as these stocks as we as we learn more about the new crop, and we're we're in a low stock scenario, that price is going to be very responsive to any change in the stock level because there's not a lot to go around. So as we as this yield becomes realized, um, prices could fluctuate very rapidly, uh, one direction or the other. Let's talk about some of the things happening in this state, and uh, we've had a widespread series of unusual weather with large damaging hail. How do you, and we talked about this a little bit last week, but is there a change in marketing, and how much difficulty is there in marketing around extreme weather scenarios? It's, it's very difficult, right? And that's one thing, being new here to Nebraska and watching these hailstorms, um, you know, it, it it makes you wonder, you know, where, where do you have the, the, the highest risk? You know, is it in price or is it in yield? Mm -hmm. And when you see a hailstorm come through, it, it makes me think then, well, then your highest risk is, is potentially in yield. Because if you don't have anything to sell, yeah. you sure as heck don't want to don't sell anything. Right. So it may be 
puts you in, in, on the brake real heavily mm -hmm. on any, any sales. If you've made sales up to this point and you, you see, uh, uh, you know, you went through that hailstorm, you know, immediately contact your, you know, your, your broker um, for some exit plan ideas, some thoughts about that, or, or even go right, if you went to the elevator, go talk with them and, and see what, what uh, kind of options you have. You mentioned you're new. You're uh, originally from Montana, I believe, and went to Kentucky then. And some of the work you did in Kentucky was focused around trying to determine how much you should be sold around your crop insurance. That's something we talk about a decent amount uh, when you talk about new crop being sold to a certain level of crop insurance. Uh, tell me about what you've looked at and why we might want to think about it differently. Yeah, so in, in Kentucky, I'd, I was in a very similar position. And, you know, we, we hear a lot of these kind of rules of thumb. And, and so we, we investigated this stuff. And I'm going to continue that, that stuff here in Nebraska. And wh what we found is, is first we need to define risk. You know, what is it? And often I'll ask audiences, what is the risk that they're worried about? And you might get a, some blank looks a little mm -hmm. bit. And some of them, you, you hear answers usually, well, I don't want to lose money. Or you might hear s someone else say, well, I don't want to go broke. And so we decided that uh, you know we would learn, lean more towards the broke side because you can lose some money this year mm -hmm. and still farm next year. You just got to move with working capital and assets and your banker. Mm -hmm. So what we found in in defining risk as going uh, broke or what we call farm mm -hmm. failure um, that there's a few important pieces that you need to understand about your your ground and the area you farm in. One of them is the price yield relationship. You, if you're in, if you're out in eastern Nebraska, mm -hmm. raising dry land corn, it, when when yields start going down, you're so close to the to the heart of the corn belt, the prices are likely to start going up, and that's a bad scenario to be in if you forward contracted a whole bunch of bushels, because you don't have anything to sell, and then to get out of them, you're at a much higher yeah. price. Now, in, as you go west, that change is going to change quite a bit that relationship. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to keep in mind, um, and and then the other one is is how is your yield risk essentially how, how much yield risk do you have if you've had a very tight distribution of, of, of yields over time that's going to change your marketing plan to someone who's had a couple very low yield risk or, or, or yield events over in the past so those are things to keep in mind and what we found is actually it's it's the optimal point of expected income and risk is much lower than the guarantee bushels being sold Next week, North Dakota State Extension economist Frayne Olson will join us to look at the condition of winter wheat across the country. We're now more than a week removed from a severe weather event when hail tore apart corn and soybean fields in parts of the state. UNL Extension held field days this week in Bradshaw, Marquette and Euling aimed at helping producers make management decisions in affected areas. The damage near Euling came from a storm that hit Norfolk with hail but might have done its worst damage as it moved on. More than 120 farmers gathered in Euling Tuesday to learn more about assessing the damage, determining insurance options, and moving forward with the same or a new crop. We traveled there to give you a glimpse of the decisions farmers are being forced to make. This area right south and east of Euling, Nebraska, and we're in the northeast corner of Dodge County, was probably the most severe area impacted. In terms of the trees, the leaves are gone, and in terms of crop damage, is probably some of the most that farmers have seen in this area in their lifetime. If the calendar didn't say otherwise, you'd think this was an early spring landscape. Replanting here has begun or has already been finished in some fields. Even some corn, which might have been young enough to come back, couldn't escape the storm's high winds and large hail. Most of the area that was, that was hardest hit was probably in that V4 to V6 stage, which is right where the growing, growing points either at the surface or right below. And so we had two things happen. With the velocity of the hail plus the wind, we had dents you know, in the ground. So even though it may have been at V5, we're still getting some damage to the growing point. And then we're also getting some rot right above the growing point on some plants that were further behind. As we showed you last week, the initial recommendation after hail is to wait at least a few days to see how plants recover. But each day that passes takes with it potential yield. You know, we're at a very critical stage now, the end of the corn planting season or the planting um, period. Uh, a lot of decisions have to be made in the next two or three days, you know, and there's a lot of money on the table. Last week's storms injured both corn and soybean fields. In some cases, hail cut soybeans at ground level, eliminating any chance for regrowth. 
UNL Extension educator Nathan Mueller says this cornfield was estimated to have between 5 to 11,000 viable plants per acre, well short of the normal dryland planting rate around 28,000 plants per acre. And the ability for these crops to close their leaves in reduced stands now brings another problem for farmers. Uh, the main thing is going to be long season weed control. Uh, with this type of stand we have behind us, it's just going to be problematic even from that standpoint. Yeah, that's one of the things we're concerned about. Uh, water hemp and Palmer amaranth and morning glories, they tend to be very late emergers and the hail has reduced the canopy out there. Um, so if folks have a very reduced canopy, thinking about uh, additional residual herbicide to try to pick up uh, late emerging water hemp might be of benefit to them. Because of previous applications, growers might be forced into what they do next. UNL Extension weed science educator Lowell Sandell says an atrazine application would technically require farmers to come back with corn or grain sorghum during a replant. Producers here might be able to get some assistance with the help of crop insurance if they carry it. Last year, Nebraska's farmers insured 91% of their corn acres and 92% of their soybean acres. While crop insurance was criticized in talks leading up to the new farm bill, Agent Scott Euling says crop insurance in these situations might be the difference between farming and not farming. I think there may be a little misconception in that some people think it, it could be a money maker for guys, and, and it really isn't. It's covering the cost so they can come back and farm again this year. Uh, some farmers are pretty well financially off, while others, are, you know, they're just getting going, and something like this can be a lifesaver. Euling says communication between the farmer and the insurance agent has been critical during this time and expresses the necessity of good record keeping for events like this in the future. There might also be additional assistance at the federal level for the storm in this area. FSA County Executive Director Brian Ralston says Farm Service Agency offices have compiled data to file loss assessment reports in Dodge, Washington, Burt, and Cumming counties. If um, things go um, the way they have in the past, the state FAC committee, which would be like the heads of Farm Service Agency, NRCS, Extension Education, would then request a damage assessment report at DAR, DAR report. Then we would compile data for that. And if things go forth there, then we possibly have um, declarations set up by um, the people in Washington, D.C. For the time being, farmers in this and other hail-affected regions of Nebraska have had to make the decision of replanting or letting the crop grow. The choice is especially difficult when the majority of the growing season is still ahead. Uh, it's, that's tough. That's, it's, all you can do is, is draw a line in the sand and, and, and use this as a starting point w with the information that you have today, um, all the way from crop prices to potential yield in a, in a field like this. And, and what is my potential indemnity payment given a, a normal year? Hard decision to make and that what makes even more pressure is the amount of money involved. We'll continue to update you on storm damage and possible problems during the growing season on future episodes of Market Journal. The Lester F. Larson Tractor Test and Power Museum on UNL's East Campus is rolling out a new look and direction. In the June Nebraska Farmer, you can read about the new design and focus of the renovation. Lance Todd, the manager of the museum since 2012, says he wants to feature exhibits that tell the story of the UNL Tractor Test Lab. One exhibit displays a model of a Minneapolis Ford 816 that led to the creation of the tractor test lab in 1918 because it didn't perform as advertised. You can find more information on the museum in June's Nebraska Farmer. There are seven species of herbicide-resistant weeds in Nebraska. Common water hemp, Palmer amaranth, kochia, shatter cane, mare's tail, giant ragweed, and red root pigweed. Some of these have also shown resistance stacking or resistance to multiple herbicides. A new UNL Extension publication details the evolution of resistance and urges growers to use an integrated weed, man weed management program with a variety of control measures. UNL Extension weed management specialist Amit Jala talked with us earlier this week and gave us an update on resistance issues in the state. Uh, so far, we have seven weed species that are resistant to at least one group of herbicides. Some of the weed species, for example, common water hemp, that has been confirmed resistant to number of uh, herbicides, for example, 2,4-D, glyphosate, ALS chemistries. And uh, out of uh, seven weed species, uh, there are six weed species that are broadleaf weed species and only one weed species that is uh, grass weed species and which is satyrcan that has been confirmed resistant to ALS group of herbicides. How did this resistance develop in Nebraska? It's just a simple concept of uh, using the same herbicide 
or herbicide with the same mode of action using continuously for many years and that is how weeds are developing selection pressure and at the end of the story they will be resistant to that particular herbicide that has been used continuously on the same field. We hear a lot about using different modes of action. When someone says mode of action, what does that mean when they're talking about herbicides to, tr to control weeds? So each herbicide works differently and uh, that is known as mode of action. What is the actual mechanism of action that inhibits the particular enzyme and that is how it will kill the weed species. And the idea here to use multiple mode of action is because each herbicide, as I told you, works differently. So it is always better to use different herbicides that belongs to different mode of action. And that is the way to rotate your herbicide chemistries. And that might be useful to reduce the selection pressure on individual herbicide. You mentioned there were seven species that are herbicide resistant in Nebraska. Are there any suspected of being resistant as well? Right, so last year we have collected seeds from a field. It was a soybean field uh, where glyphosate was used repeatedly and we collected seeds of um, common ragweed uh, that was not being controlled by repeated application of glyphosate and right now we are investigating that particular common ragweed uh, species and uh, maybe in future we'll provide you some more update about uh, level of resistance or whether it is resistant or not. How important is this issue for Nebraska farmers? There might be some farmers who have these resistant weeds in their fields. There might be some that don't have these we resistant weeds in their fields, but why is this important that they know either way? Uh, it is important because we have been using glyphosate for the last many years and as a result of that, in Nebraska right now, we have four weed species, including Merstel, giant ragweed, common water hemp, and kochia that are resistant to glyphosate. So at some point, although the growers that think like we don't have any glyphosate resistant weed in my field, but still I would say this is important to know about some other herbicide mode of action or try to use some other method of weed control to make sure that they do not end up with having glyphosate resistant weed species in their field. How hard could weed control in Nebraska be if growers don't change the way they try to manage these weeds? It might be challenging, right? So I think this is the right time to think about different herbicide programs that might be more effective rather than relying on single herbicide. Are there any new technologies available for managing resistant weeds in corn and soybeans? Right, so there are some new technologies uh, that might be commercialized in near future for example, for the last few years, we have been testing dicamba resistant soybean and that might be useful for control of uh, glyphosate resistant weeds or any other herbicide resistant weeds that is not resistant to glyphos uh, dicamba. And in corn? And uh, also, yeah, 240 resistant corn and soybeans that we are also testing for the last few years and uh, that might be a good option. But again, if it will not be utilized in a sustainable manner, then we would end up with having multiple, or as we mentioned, stacked resistant weed species. So that new technology, once it will be commercialized, it should also be used in an integrated approach with some other herbicides or with some other herbicide resistant crop species. UNL Extension's new circular on herbicide-resistant weeds in Nebraska can be found through the Market Journal website. You can also learn more about controlling weeds at upcoming field days. On June 27th in Clay Center, UNL Extension will hold a weed management field day near the South Central Ag Lab. And on July 9th and 10th, there will be herbicide-resistant weed management field days in Fremont and Lincoln. Those two events are sponsored by UNL Extension and the Nebraska Soybean Board. More information on those field days can also be found on marketjournal.unl.edu. Nebraska is the second largest producer of ethanol in the country. It's also one of the leading states for cattle on feed. Those two stats have led to a cattle industry that uses ethanol byproducts such as distiller's grains. Since wet distiller's grain has gained an important role in feedlot diets, UNL meat scientists have been trying to see if it impacts meat quality. Earlier this week, we talked with UNL Assistant Professor of Meat Science Gary Sullivan, who said distiller's grains can lead to higher oxidation levels, but those effects can also be counteracted. 
So there had been a lot of studies that had been conducted here at University of Nebraska as well as other universities that have looked at the effect of feeding distillers grains to cattle and other species uh, as well, but how that impacts fresh meat characteristics. Um, a lot of the impact can be with lipid oxidation and also discoloration of the product during retail display. When we got started looking at this study or talking about the possibilities for the study, not, no one had really looked at cooked meat characteristics. And so we were interested to see if that oxidation effect carried through to cooked products and then also what we could do to help counteract that effect if, if there was one. Why is it important? Why is the oxidation component important? So when fats oxidized, uh, the problem is really flavor characteristics. Uh, we get a rancid or off, uh, a rancid or warmed over off flavor that really is, uh, makes the product unpalatable or it, it's more of a flavor uh, and sensory quality characteristic as opposed to a safety concern. What did you find here? You looked at wet distillers grains specifically because wet distillers grains are a big part of diets here in Nebraska feedlots. Did you find that there was an impact to meat quality? Yeah, so when you look at distillers grain, especially in the state of Nebraska, the ethanol industry is a huge player. Uh, at the same time, they also use a lot of corn, which we have to replace in the animal diets. And so when we look at ethanol being produced, we're really concentrating the components that aren't used in ethanol. So we concentrate protein and minerals, and then also the fatty acids, or the, the we're concentrating the oil, corn oil in it. And so when we do that, we actually increase the amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids that we're being fed, and that can carry over into the products. And so when we look at those polyunsaturated fatty acids, they're more prone to oxidation. And so we wanted to carry that through to the cooked product to see of the effect. Uh, when we do feed distiller's grain, both on the fresh side and then also it carries through to the cooked side, we do see an increase in oxidation that takes place. And that kind of makes sense due to the increasing amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids. What about the shelf life of meat? Does that change at all? And so what can happen in the shelf life is in fresh meats, we get more discoloration to take place and then also the flavor tends to deteriorate. In the cooked products, because color isn't as important because we're already changing it during cooking, it's really a shelf life concern. So we shorten the shelf life of the quality shelf life of products. Significantly? In fresh meats, it tends to be a few days shorter in retail display. In cooked products, we have a much longer shelf life that we look at. Uh, there is significant differences between the diet. Fortunately, we can actually take care of some of that uh, with different processing and ing ingredients that we use. Now you said that uh, this can be taken care of. So as we said, it's a big part of diets. It doesn't need to be changed. Yeah, we, I'm not promoting or saying we should be taking distiller's grain out of the diet because it's not gonna happen. It's not realistic from a, a st standpoint. Now, it is important for meat processors to understand what their raw material is. Now, this, in a follow-up study that we did, we actually added um, antioxidants to the, com or to the cooked beef products that we worked with. Uh, we actually added, it was a rosemary and green tea extract and so we can concentrate some of the antioxidant compounds in, uh, in those two components and we could add it to the product. And when we did that, it actually took out all the dietary effects. And so we were able, no matter how the animals were fed, it, there was a similar amount of oxidation when we added the, amount, the antioxidants. Essentially making it back to normal? Making it back to normal, exactly. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here again for the weekly forecast. Of course, the big news was the significant rain event that occurred over western Nebraska, particularly from southwest up to north central Nebraska, where we had numerous reports, anywhere from two upwards of seven inches of moisture, but broad base, we were looking at three to four inches common in a wide swath, essentially McCook northward through the Valentine area. And this amounts to essentially a full month's worth of precipitation over a 36 hour period, not including the precipitation that fell prior to this event. So when we look at June precipitation, we have a good majority of the state that's already broken our normal June precipitation. And we have areas up north, east of Valentine, northwest of uh, Ainsworth, that we're pushing six and a half to seven inches for the month. So very welcome moisture. We'd like to see a break, at least get some initial drying done for, for those that are trying to, to harvest their hay. But it looks like we're going to have to deal with at least a couple more precipitation events before we may get into a drier pattern. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we have going on. And the one thing I'll draw your attention to is that we do have some energy in the southwest that's going to push toward 
our region, and that's going to drag a cold front from the Dakotas through the state. So we should start to see a semblance of precipitation breaking out in the northwestern part of the state, although it looks to be very spotty. As it gets further eastward, it's going to draw into more significant moisture, and we do have the ability to generate thunderstorm activity this evening, and more importantly as we go into tomorrow, we'll notice that there is a piece of energy that slides just to the south of Nebraska, and that should bring a good uh, area of scattered thunderstorm activity to south central Nebraska and southeast Nebraska, and as you move up toward the northwest, much low, lower totals. Then we get a slight break as we get into Monday. There's another piece of energy that's going to slide through as this trough ties to deepen. That looks like it's going to bring that thunderstorm activity into our region Monday afternoon, Monday evening, and carry it out into Tuesday. More importantly, it looks for it to be more in eastern Nebraska, western Nebraska, it's going to be closer to this ridge, so we're not going to see much in the way of significant moisture. Now, as we go into Tuesday, we'll draw some colder air down into our region. The rain activity moves to the eastern Corn Belt. So we should get some drying and, and possibly start to see some warmer temperatures as the ridge tries to build in, but another weak disturbance moves through Wednesday evening that might give some isolated shower activity to southeast, south-central Nebraska, but more importantly, we start to see ridging patterns starting to develop on Thursday, and it starts to continue on into Friday, so much warmer conditions. With all the moisture that's fallen to the south, of us. If we start to see these temperatures rising up in the upper 80s, low 90s, it's going to be very sticky, very humid, and it could potentially pose some problems in terms of cattle, especially our feedlots, where heat indices have caused problems in the past. So let's take a look at the numbers. We're looking at cooler conditions in the northwest, some warmer conditions in the southeast, scattered thunderstorms off and on, mainly across eastern Nebraska. Then we start to see a gradual warming trend toward the end of next week with isolated thunderstorm development possible. As we look at the 8 to 14 day forecast, the Climate Prediction Center is indicating for next Thursday to the following Tuesday, below normal temperatures, and also looking at above normal precipitation to our east. The numerical models that I'm looking at show well above normal temperatures we get from next Thursday to the following Tuesday. Thanks, Al. Today's information on the USDA's June crop report, Nebraska's farmers recovering from hail damage, herbicide-resistant weeds in the state, and the effect of distillers' grains on meat quality can be found on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. Next week, Frayne Olson will join us to analyze how a smaller 2014 winter wheat crop could affect prices. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board, the Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. No matter how you look at it, animal agriculture helps Nebraska's economy. The livestock industry provides increased tax revenues for schools and community services. Livestock enterprises also create jobs while contributing to existing businesses such as local banks and grocery stores. A thriving livestock industry helps maintain our current way of life, but also provides opportunities for the next generation of farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff helps to raise awareness of the importance of animal agriculture to Nebraska.